Thank you for coming. Uh, I know it's tough in the midst of our hectic life, but I appreciate uh, being here, and I really like being in Miami. Every time I come, it feels like a little bit as I come for vacation, and you land the plane, and you try to forget that you're actually coming for work. And it's really, everything is nice. It's, you know, people are nice in Miami. I just went to the bathroom just before, and there was a note on the door that says, have an awesome day. <laughs> Who has that? In New York, if, if you have a note on the door, it says, I don't want to say what it says. <laughs> but I enjoy talking to students because I think that I empathize with the feeling of being an architectural student uh, as I feel myself being one. Even though I graduated about 16 years ago, I feel like my everyday life is very much this anxiety and this search for solutions that we have no uh, you know, clear uh, definition for. And that anxiety that builds itself inside ourselves needs to be kind of got used to because this is our life as architects. So what I want to do today is show you a few examples of our work in New York City and tell you a little story uh, maybe about the office and myself, and hopefully have enough time to get some questions. And I'll start with a project that uh, we started about a year ago, and it's a mixed-use uh, project in a neighborhood called Bushwick. It's going to be one of the biggest developments that has been done in Brooklyn to date, period. And Bushwick, if you don't know, what you see in this picture is considered the cool neighborhood to be right now in New York, you know, where the artists go to and where the art scene is. And you know, it changes by the day. It used to be Williamsburg like two weeks ago. But the reality of uh, Bushwick uh, urbanistically is it's a very fragmented structure. It has a mix of affordable housing. It may have a mix of uh, low-rise uh, housing. It has industrial buildings, and it's super fragmented. The city block is open, which creates opportunity for great things, like you'd walk around at night and you go in a courtyard and then go up a floor and then you find a pub or a bar that nobody knows about, or a gallery or something like that. But obviously it has its weaknesses and it has crime and drug dealing, etc. But Bushwick as a neighborhood was established as a little colony, Dutch colony in 1828, and the site, which is called the Rheingold site, um, was a beer manufacturing starting in 1883, and actually in 1965 was one of the biggest manufacturing of beer in the United States. Uh, then at some point it closed in the 70s, and since then it was empty, and what happens there today is basically parties, rave parties on weekends and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. But the site is empty, and it was bought by a developer. If you see Bushwick here, you see Williamsburg that you might heard of, the neighboring uh, neighborhood, and you see the L-line train, so it's actually 20 minutes away from New York City, but the site is closer to Williamsburg, and East Williamsburg, if you look at that map, has all of this purple, which is still an industrial area, that is being slowly converted and rezoned into residential as well. So here's a zoom at the site, and you see how fragmented and how diverse the site is, right? You've got this footprint, the big one, which is the Rheingold site, it used to be a one story building, a factory, and then you've got all of these kind of small residential towers, and then you've got the row housings, et cetera. But if you look at the zoning, New York City zoning, you'll see that what the city wants it to be is this. You recognize it? This is the New York City block. New York City is built of circle of blocks with streets grid. And What's amazing is that the courtyards, if you look at Manhattan even from above, you'll see the courtyards capture about 30% of the open space of Manhattan, but it's not used by anybody almost. And in the best case scenario, it's used by private gardens, et cetera. More often than not, it's some storage and mechanical rooms, et cetera. So we thought, since we have two of those blocks on our site, can we maintain the quality of fragmentation that exists within the site today in Bushwick, that beautiful kind of uh, human scale uh, series of courtyards and streets that are pedestrians with the idea of New York City and create something in between? And we ended up basically with a block that is divided in the middle that 
uh, middle street we gave back to the city as a, as a park, and then the rest of it is a series of streets and courtyards that becomes open to the public and bleeds into the core itself of the entire project. So if you look at it in 3D, this is the zoning. So this is what the city gives you to build. And this is what we came up with, where this becomes a public park that is open to the public into small courtyards at the ground floor. The pieces that were missing then became bridges to connect between all of the pieces together and eventually become a huge park on the roof. On that park, it's really big, think about it, every block is about 400 feet. We've got a bike lane, we've got urban farming, we've got a swimming pool, dog runs, et cetera, et cetera. So that becomes like a big green area on the roof of that complex. Down below, we kind of extend the idea of a commercial street or the idea of an urban street into these courtyards and take all of the what's called amenities. And you guys are probably very well versed with amenities in high-end buildings, right? It's basically, there's a gym, there's a lounge, it's all like dead-end rooms. And we scattered them around the courtyard itself, and now they became the fabric of the building itself, actually the fabric of the city. And some of them are galleries and open houses, et cetera, that could be open to the public at certain hours. Above that, you've got the apartments, and if you look at the plan, you'll see that what's typical, typically a double-loaded corridor becomes a single-loaded corridor at least once, sometimes twice, on every courtyard. So the journey from the courtyard or from your core to your apartment actually opens up to the experience of the courtyard. So essentially, it's a stacking diagram which has a garden, it has a series of apartments, it has a series of public yards and courtyards that are predominantly pedestrian, very similar to what you have here in the campus, which I love. And then you've got a basement floor, which is a working area with skylights, like a WeWork type, uh, that serves the building uh, tenants. And so what we think is important about the building, less than its mass, is the voids that it creates. The empty spaces are sculpted and designed as important as the shell itself. And what you see is you see those creations of in and out courtyards. This is from the roof, of course into a diverse typologies of outdoor spaces. Some of them are quiet, some of them are heavily landscaped. All of them are bordering with amenities or galleries or cafes, shops, and they open between themselves so there's a transparency between each one to the next one over. That kind of feeling of layering. Uh, this is what we call the, uh, the city square, and that's the library park, and here is the active square. We've got the gym the pool, indoor pool, et cetera. And this is a view from the park. Now, I think it's very interesting. About a month ago, I kind of cleaned my uh, desk and I find my work from uh, my last graduate year, about 16 years ago from Bezalel School in Jerusalem, and I found this project. And I was struck by the fact that there's so many similarities between this project that I just showed you and this project that I did at school. Without really knowing much, what I did is I kind of arranged the city in a new format by which housing was at the top, offices were below, commercial was below, and then it was like a big sponge that has a series of streets and courtyards that connect everything together. So what happened in those 16 years between school and now? Let me tell you a short story. I came to New York in, 1990, uh, in 1999 and joined uh, Perkins Sisman, was there for seven years, and in 2007, I uh, was foolish enough to open my own office. It was a studio apartment on the Upper West Side, a walk up, and uh, four people were even foolisher to join me. And we sat around the table and we had our own projects, which was the first one that we got, and that's the way we worked. And today our office is much bigger. We're on Park Avenue. There's about 85 people at the office. Uh, but the work is done very much similarly, where everybody's sitting around a table from the interns to the most senior people, and we exchange ideas. We build models and study models, and uh, we work on different formats. Uh, but it's interesting to see that there's 25 nationalities represented in our office. We take people from around the world. Through the years, pretty equal number of uh, male and female. 
And our projects, if you see here, starting in 2007, has started really kind of expanding in 2010, 2011, to a point where today we're extremely busy in, in, uh, in uh, kind of shaping the city and, and now other cities as well. So a lot of it is in the culture of the office. You know, we have our 3D printers. We build a lot of 3D models. We toy around with our ideas back and forth. Uh, we make fun. We get depressed. But I think over the years, we kind of backed into ideas that are all connected to what we call unboxing New York. And what it is is really New York City, if you look at it in a very simple version, is extrusion of boxes. Every footprint of a tower or a building is extruded into a building. Uh, the more air rights you get, the higher you can go. And the city is built like that. And we thought that there's a big disparity between your dead end box we call apartments and the overcrowded streets, and there's nothing really in between. Um, and so we started doing these models. And what you see here is basically what we call the breathing room of a building. To what degree, within the zoning regulations, within what you can do in the city by code, the building can expand and contract, and by that create a more three-dimensional uh, life to the people that live in it. More corners, opportunities, more outdoor spaces, etc. And we're basing this on three main desires that we feel are extremely connected to architecture. Very simple. One is the desire to see far and beyond. We want to see right beyond the wall. We'd like to see far. We'd like to open the window and see something beyond. We'd like to the urge to be shielded and protected, right? The thing that wants to bring us to, to our, our basic uh, our bionic shape. And then, oops, the need to leave inside and out. And we call this the vertical village. I want to show you three type of buildings. The first one is mid-rise residential, high-rise, and urban, and mixed use. And the way we kind of categorize our building in the office is based on the voids that they create. Uh, and so about two years ago, or maybe even more, we got to design this building. It's called the Flynn. It's in Chelsea. Um, the building is built. It's a condo. But you know, in New York, there's something very interesting. Something is called the street wall, which means that you have to maintain a full flat facade to the street before you can start setting back. And then what you have is you've got the setback, or what we call the wedding cake, right? And the idea was to bring more light into the streets. I mean, there's something to say about the fact that these codes are not relevant uh, or to some degree are not relevant because the light should be treated e uh, differently from different directions, et cetera. But across the board, basically, that's what they tell you. And then the zoning allows you to do what's called a dormer. You see that area here? Which is basically a projection back into the facade that is calculated by some sort of a triangle. We thought to ourselves, that distance between the setback and the front facade is a territory by which we can exploit the idea of three-dimensional living, even though it's small. And what would happen if we take that and we kind of spread it around? A few things. First of all, we'll get much more outdoor spaces to the apartments above. Second, we can place the program where we want it in order to create different typologies of apartment. And most importantly, we have create this area in between that is not inside, it's not outside. It's really the extension of the building life. So we claim that some of these apartments feel more like a home than an apartment, more like a house than an apartment, I'm sorry. And the reason is that it has an expansion into the outside that acts more like a private home. This is the building during construction. That leads us into another commission that we got later, which is Jackson Avenue in Long Island City. Whoever have been in Long Island City, there's PS1, which is the extension of MoMA. And across from PS1, this developer bought this land and he wanted to build a rental project. Budget was low, so he came to us and says, we have no money, but we want to do something special. It's the story of our life, right? And so 
since we were captured by this idea of the dormer, we said, can we do it throughout the building, right? And we said, if this is the zoning envelope of the building, what if we just look at it as a flat building that is greeted in a very, very simple manner? Because we knew that the budget is tight, the system has to be simple, the structure has to be simple. And then we plugged into it three typologies of apartments. Studio, one bedroom, and two bedroom, right? So every time, the studio is a little longer than the envelope. Every time you plug a studio in, you create this kind of music on the facade of the building. And that diversity was totally flexible. We can put it and comp compose it the way we wanted. But eventually, every time that that happens, it creates an outdoor space for the apartment above, a corner window for that apartment, and this territory in between, which we felt has a quality of a vertical village. The systems were all stacked because the apartment's bathrooms and all of their plumbing were at the back side. And so we cut that section, which you'll see in other projects as well. These sections kind of represents the extension, the, the breathing room of a building. And as you can see, we have a lot of fun with this. This guy is jumping. The reality is not as exciting. But this is just before they finished construction. And the building was on budget. It was actually a pretty low budget cast in place concrete and was fully rented for premium prices. Uh, super excited. The next project, and the last one in the small scale, is this one. It's a project we did in Williamsburg. And here it was a little bit upscale. After somebody saw the building, he said, oh, can we do a condo building on that theory? And we said, can we now expand the idea of an apartment, small generic apartments, into this idea of little houses? So basically, typically, a one bedroom is a living room and a bedroom. But we kind of divide into three bays, kitchen, living room, bedroom. Bedroom gets a corner, living room gets a corner, wraparound terrace, big 10 by 10 terrace, and a kitchen behind. Now, think about it as little kind of jigsaw puzzle. And then we kind of, after we composed that, we did a two bedroom, and we put them together in a way that allowed the light and air, complies with all the zoning codes of New York City, provides the privacy. And a typical kind of New York City building would be a base with a penthouse with two lucky people that can afford it. Uh, and we've provided a building that all of it is a series of penthouses. So here is your kitchen is on the back, dining room, the terrace, the living room, and the bedroom is on the right. And this is the model we've created. Again, if you go into it, you'll see that the set, the cantilevers are always seven feet, which is the maximum you can cantilever with concrete. The column's going straight down. But that expansion is what creates the richness of that building. 100 North Fork is a building that was uh, designed also about a year ago. And it's basically our uh, intuition that a mid-block building here could expand and become like a mushroom, a corner building. So this was the site. But the developer bought air rights from the neighboring building. So basically, we could take those air rights and we could cantilever out three times, pushing most of the program to the top, and basically emptying the bottom of the building, creating a three-story lobby. So the Tradition Tower has most of the era, area and the apartments down at the bottom. And then only lucky ones gets the top. We flipped it on its head. And basically clearing the adjacent building's roof, most of the floor area and most of the apartment at the top, creating a much bigger roof, and using the volume that we took at the bottom to become a three-story lobby. One of the gardens is on the roof of the adjacent building, which again brought us to the section how the building becomes like a tree to these outdoor spaces. The next project is a high rise, or three high rises projects, rental in Williamsburg on the East River. This is Kent Avenue. This is the Williamsburg Bridge. You might know the sugar factory building that is designed by shop that is now under construction on the other side. And here we got a zoning of three towers. It was obvious that we need to maximize the views, right? So we positioned the building in a way to maximize its views. But then we thought, 
When you do an extruded rental building that has 12 or 16 apartments per floor, only four of them are corner apartments, right? And those corner apartments are always premium. Like everybody wants to rent them. They get higher rent. They're more desirable. What would happen if we create a plan by which every apartment has a corner view or a corner living room, right? And it's not that complex. It's just not rectangle. The core stays where it is. We came up with a few floor plans where the core is static. And then we stacked them and created a situation by which all of the three towers, all of the apartments, about 700 in numbers, are corner apartments. That's the back side, and that's in between the towers. Again, the gap between the towers, what we would call in our office the vertical village, is the interaction or the tension that is created between the two buildings, and we feel it's as important as the building itself. You see, it's hard to see, but the profile of, this, of the section is similar to the profile of the building. This building is under construction about a year away from completion. The next one, hopefully, will start construction in February, and it's one of those slender towers of New York. You know, it's a very diverse topic, or uh, difficult for architects. Because the essence of creating such a tall slinging tower is questionable, especially in the light that there's only 20 apartments in this entire thing. But we thought to ourselves, if, if you do a slender tower, can you look at it differently than your typical office building that is basically stretched to the extent of its program? And what we've done is basically stretch the tower beyond its program. So after we stacked all of the floor area, we kept on stretching it beyond creating gaps between the floors. And these gaps are serving as private gardens. So every apartment, every floor is an apartment, and then you either go down or up to your garden through that stair. Now, there are two things that people told us. Number one, the city is never going to approve it because it's a cover garden. But there's nothing in the codes that says that you can't cover an outdoor space. It just says that it needs to be more than 50% open in its surroundings. So we went back to the code. We went to the city and said it's totally legit. They agreed. The second thing is, what are you going to do with wind? Who needs a garden at 600 feet in the air in New York? So we went through a very extensive uh, wind tunnel in Canada. And we found something quite amazing. And by the way, this is the only once, only once we got that, the developer actually agreed to continue with this project, is that because it's open from all sides, it has the core and I guess the configuration of the columns, the wind that goes through not only reduces the lateral loaded loads on the building itself, it creates a circulation of air within that pocket that slows down the movement of the air inside it. And so even at 600 feet, the wind measurements on every given corner were about equivalent to a roof at the 10th floor building somewhere here. That's a huge revelation. And by the way, I'm very proud to say that if you look now at new towers that are being built in New York, like Shop and others, you'll see this kind of gaps appearing on these towers. So, it's over the top, it's crazy. The structure elements and the core takes most of the footprint of the apartment, which is very typical to those slender towers, but at least we got a typology that is totally different and interesting. And so we did our sections and we thought, well, if the architecture is actually an expression of the fact that it's a residential building with gardens as opposed to just decorations at the top, that's an achievement. I want to show you a few urban buildings uh, before I let you, you know, ask some questions if you want. Uh, this building is also in Brooklyn, and it's a full block residential building. And one of the things that we kind of stretched our head around was the idea of a dead end. The idea of a dead end in the city is something that we all kind of learned to live with and accept. You go into an elevator, you go up, you go a corridor, and you've got a dead end apartment maybe with nice views if you're really wealthy, but you're still kind of dead end. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's like a jail in a way. Where is the life where we can circulate around? We could go in on one side and enter on the other side, et cetera, et cetera. And can we kind of create something like that 
in a multifamily building. So we shaped the volume to do two things. One is to create a park through the building that is open to the public. Otherwise, these are just courtyards that are kind of captured inside for the, uh, for the people who live in the building only. And by that, actually creating retail on both sides that is great for the retail. And the other thing is stepping the roof in a way that every floor above the third floor has a direct access to the roof, meaning every floor, if you go at the end of the corridor, you end up at the roof. And then you go up the roof, and you can go in inside. And that created endless number of loops within the building itself through what we call the building park at the top. The next project is not residential. And I want to show it because the idea of urban voids or closing the disparity between like what we say our rooms or our apartment or whatever and the overcrowded street can be achieved in many programs. So we got this existing building right here. It used to be an industrial building in, in uh, Williamsburg. And the program was two floors of commercial, 100 key hotel. Typical. Now, who needs two floors of commercial in Williamsburg in that neighborhood? Nobody. I mean, if anybody is going to activate the ground floor, that would be fantastic. The second floor is really a waste of time. Nobody's going to go up there. And then the rooms of the hotel, that's fine. We said, can we create a gathering place or an urban place that would maximize its potential? And we divided the program into two and creating an outer loop that goes inside the building up the second floor of retail and back down. So there's sort of like the formula of a shopping loop, if you will. One can come in, go up, and come down. So it's not at that end. Activating the second floor. Then put the hotel rooms on top of it, shape them to bring more light into that loop, and cantilevering to create an active gap between the two. Now, all of this is within the zoning envelope of the building. Nothing is not allowed by code. So at the end, if you'd come from the street, you end up here in this outside auditorium. And then there's a market on top on the second floor with the stores on the second floor. And then you'd come down and come back out. The gaps between the two became event spaces and gathering spaces and restaurants and bars. And then the rooms are part of that show, of that event space. And then the bar at the top as well. So this entire structure is held by two centers here and here. And the entire room structure is a big truss, creating that opening in between and the two floor mall market, if you will. Which brings me into the last project. Talked about Toronto. And we did this competition in Toronto. And, and I don't know if you've been there, but I was struck the first time I was there how disconnected the city is from its amazing lake. I mean, if you take the lake out from this, it looks like uh, Hong Kong. If you, like the city, you take the city out, it looks like the Bahamas. And how are the two connected? It's really quite amazing that they're not. And so we've come up with a building on the shoreline to try to exploit the idea of city and water, city and views, city and landscape. This was the envelope. So we started here. It's a step building, basically, with a double loaded corridor of apartments. We said, well, can we make a more extreme step and have more opportunities for outdoor spaces? And then if that's the case, can we create corners for every room and living room by just shifting the grid 45 degrees. And then if we shift between the two floors, then we get this outdoor spaces for every apartment. So this is about 11 by 11 square. Which means that the amount of outdoor space accumulatively in this entire building is about 50% more of the footprint of the building itself. And so we maximize the views. We create an outdoor space, which is a terrace and not a balcony like the rest of Toronto is built. And there's a huge difference between the two. 
This is a wrap around this outdoor space become an extension of your apartment. And then build the double loaded corridor with a single core and a moving stair with these apartments that are basically tilted 45 degrees throughout the entire building. At the street level, we've created townhomes with their own entrance and landscape and activated the park that is next by. And the amenities were on the second floor opening up into the view of the lake. So that kind of brings me back to my school project and I'll kind of finish with that. What I've done there is was sort of a crazy idea of taking a huge part of the city and reorganizing it by having pedestrian streets and courtyards where the roof would be private homes uh, living on a park, and then below it, they're gonna be a commercial and an office building, which looks something like that. And the section was something like that, where all of these are gaps for light and public interaction. And if this was an, a project in the office today, we'd probably gonna, we would probably market it as such. And with that, I just wanna finish and tell you guys the three Fs that I always tell students. Find your idea, follow your instinct, and fight conventions, because conventions are trying to force us to stay within the acceptable and the stuff that we know. Thank you. When you go into these, um, let's say, infill, what are really infill buildings, I think what's interesting of what you're doing is you're trying to say that the infill building can have a really fundamental role in, in making, and sometimes even a neighborhood, right? These, the ideas that these are, these are sort of, they change the culture of the place, right? Rather than just infill and bring right. a several number of apartments. But, um, have you been interested, have you been pursuing public projects or projects of a more public dimension? And if you have, what would you say is the difference in attitude between, between facing those two? Well, we are very much interested in the intensified urban fabric. So not that I'm not interested in, in designing a building in, uh, in, the, you know, in the countryside, but our real concentration right now is in that urban fabric, condensed fabric, with the acknowledgement that with time, it's just gonna get more and more intensified, and more condensed. And the question is what kind of answers we predict. First of all, what kind of problems we identify with this situation, and not just accepting it's great. And by the way, I love living in New York City, but I think that this is, there's a huge problem with that disparity of people living in those dead-end apartments, there's no much, not enough in between spaces, and no communal spaces, et cetera. So to that degree, if it's commercial or public project, I think it should act the same way. We didn't have, or we weren't fortunate enough yet to get serious commissions that are a public or commercial project, We're working actually on two schools right now, which we're very excited about. But we find that similar formula work on almost every public project because we're talking about human experience. And for us, the human urban experience in an urban intensified area is the, explo the exploitation of the in and out in a way that creates modes for gathering and, and, and opening and interactions that is more than two dimensional. We're too much building on a curtain wall buildings where the interface is just two inches, if you're lucky, sometimes it's less. And that interface is not healthy and it's not great architecture. And we're too obsessed with making forms and shapes that looks good on the skyline, but what about the expansion of the human experience? If we had a chance to build a community building or commercial building, I suspect that we would treat it very similarly but we're still waiting for the opportunity to be invited. Anything else? Yeah. Thank you for the lecture and yeah. for the amazing body of work that has developed very quickly. 
But since you show your student project, I'm wondering if, as a student in Israel, if Moshe Safdi was a big figure <laughs> in the, habit, the Habitat project, right. was that part, like, was that very important in your uh, Shepherd? Yeah, I think that imaginary, the uh, Safdi's project in Toronto was a revelation for me. And I can't even remember when, but it was built before I even uh, became a student for, architect, for architecture. Uh, and I still think to, to this day it's his best uh, work. Uh, I don't think he's trying to repeat it, I think, now in kind of vertical towers as well. Uh, and I thought that it was kind of before its time in the sense that it really addressed the idea of uh, condensed urbanism in, in a vertical village scenario. And it definitely is something that I was influenced by. Uh, obviously, it was in a sprawl, that it was open sprawl. It wasn't a, an intense city. It's more of a free form on the water. But I think uh, in many ways, it was uh, very influential. There's a similarity, of course, but what's going on in your project, it's different. Like, what, uh, what I think when you look at his, uh, when you look at Habitat, it's more about the expression of a, a kind of the teeming hive, right? All the, the, the kind of all the, the messy, almost organic uh, expression of uh, vitality. Uh, uh, but in your, case, it's more about the tension between the cellular repetition of a modern uh, canon and the expression of the individual unit within that framework. It's, it's different. Right. And actually, I think it's consistent with the trend we see. It's almost like a, a pervasive impulse. You see it in other projects like with Herzog de Moreau big, etc. There's right. this idea about the articulation of the individual unit within the repetitive framework. I'm wondering, you were very convincing in demonstrating why it makes sense from almost like a developer's perspective, mm -hmm. also from providing amenities, terraces, air, etc. But I'm wondering, given that it is a, such a, a persistent uh, image a persistent pattern we see everywhere. I'm wondering if there's something also symbolic about it in the sense that maybe it mirrors a shift in, uh, in, in a cultural understanding, but a shift from the uh, idea of a mass culture to the, an idea of the multitude, where the, the articulation of the individual in, 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 as part of a multitude is, uh, it has become very important. When you said something about how this looks more like a house rather than an, an apartment, it, for me it spoke of this kind of a new sensibility about the right. expression of the individual in the multitude. Can you maybe talk about Yeah, no, I, 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 I totally agree with that analysis. I think that there's, a, there's obviously an historical cycle. Um, that we can look at in terms of kind of intensifying cities, people coming into the cities and going back. However, I think there's new condition that we've never experienced before. The level of intensity that we need to face today in cities is unheard of and was never experienced by human period. Now, I think that to some degree, certain years were about the feasibility of putting so many people so quickly and just tectonically how we're gonna do it the infrastructure, the parks, the schools, this, 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 and that. But I think that now that we're there, there's, this, there's a generation of people that are extremely concerned with their well-being over time in, ur in urban scenarios. We wanna be in the cities. We wanna be connected to that intensity and to that knowledge base. And, but we, we also are very concerned about the qualities that impact our well-being and I think that the cities that we've created and the idea of a skyscraper extrusion doesn't answer those needs or questions. And I think that's where the urge comes in. And that's why it's successful too commercially. I mean, the people are 
attracted to this typologies of, of life because they sense, I mean, I'm not giving a lecture to every buyer, but I think they sense the idea of expansion of their life be, uh, to something that is beyond this dead end apartment box. We, look, the, the idea of living in a box with two windows that face this, it's such a modern idea. And we accept it as a given. And so many millions of people live like that. We're building those buildings. But I think that there's a sort of an urge um, to change it, which kind of drives the individual unit first. And then if you can understand that, can you multiply it into a building? And can you do it in a way that conforms with city regulations? And can you build it with a way that conforms with structure and feasibility and money and all of that good stuff? Very convincing about that. Yeah. Thank you. On the last slide that you showed, uh, two of the things that stood out to me were fight convention and follow your instincts. And so one of the things I try to instill into my students is you have to find your method of working. And one of the things I thought was very interesting about your presentation is all of the sections spoke to the same language, right? They had the same blue gradient, they had the same sort of Adobe Illustrator characters and stuff inside of it. And so can you speak to what your method of working is and how the students here can sort of find their own method of working so that they can start to develop a language of, of how they represent things and how they actually work through a project? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a constant questioning of yourself and your methodology. So we are a really young office. We, we look at ourselves as a startup, honestly. I mean, nine years is nothing, out of which three years were recession, we didn't do much. And how, first of all, how do you recognize, we used to sit in our office in, on Fridays and ask ourselves, why are we doing what we're doing? What, what's unique about ODA? What, what are our, why, what's this, you know, what are our ideas? And we felt it, or at least I felt it very strongly, kind of, because I'm a very intuitive guy. I felt that it's right, but I couldn't articulate it. And then we started, we forced ourselves into question ourselves. And then when we questioned ourselves and we came, and we came up with an answer that we liked, we then exploited it and we said, okay, let's investigate that throughout. If the section is important, let's cut section through all of our projects and check how they work. And if that works the same, then let's give it a language that now represents the idea. Now, the representation, you know, the language takes time and you kind of develop your own skills. And I think a lot of it is influenced by contemporary way of communicating ideas. We see it and we're influenced by it also. But at the end of the day, it's the questioning of the idea. Go back and back and back as so you kind of grind your own, uh, your own self. And it doesn't have to be an amazing, big, revolutionary idea. This idea of the dormer was such a small idea, but it really generated a whole new experience for us. So what I'm saying to the students all the time is like, people has, we don't learn architecture in the years of, and that's my opinion, in the few years in school. We learn architecture since we're born, because basically it's our human experience within our environment. And we have an opinion. We feel it in our bones. We, it doesn't matter what it is. We just have to listen to it and identify it because it takes time for us to understand our own ideas. So when I say find your ideas, sometimes it takes years, I feel, for people to really grasp what's their idea. Then once you find it, let's say you find it, there's gonna be a lot of skepticism or like there's gonna be a lot of questioning. You know, is it good, is it bad, why, prove it to me. So you have to kind of keep on it and ask yourself and always be true to that idea. And if you develop that, I believe eventually, because these architects, you guys have these idea, amazing ideas. 90% of architects has great ideas, but they lose them, I feel, with the time. So we try very hard not to lose our ideas, and that's the most scary thing for us. Anybody else? It's free. All right, thank you very much.